so um, welcome back, everyone. Um, so today, um, we're going to be doing a little bit of localization in a, in a certain framework in the setting of solid analytic rings. Um, but first, I want to start with a, rem uh, a recap of last time. Um, so last time, we defined the notion of analytic ring um, and that's a pair R with funny triangle uh, and then it, well the whole pair will be denoted just plain old R and it consists of an R with a funny triangle and what we would want to call the category of R modules where um, uh, so, this triangle R is a condensed ring, commutative, uh, and this mod R is a full subcategory of mod R triangle, by which I mean condensed R triangle modules, um, satisfying some axioms, some closure axioms, and the first one is that mod R is closed under all limits, co-limits, and extensions. In particular, it should be an abelian subcategory, um, but even more because I'm allowing infinite co-limits and limits here. Um, and the second is a bit funny, so if m is in uh, mod r triangle and n is in mod r, then we want to require that the internal exts uh, in this category uh, from m to n should also lie in the smaller category uh, for all i. And this um, condition was necessary to get a good tensor product uh, on this category and on the derived analog as well. I'll make a couple more remarks about that in a second. Um, and then the third condition is that our triangle itself, the unit in this category, uh, mod R triangle, should lie in mod R. What about the existence of R joints which also said one should? <laughs> so there were a couple of uh, technical points that came up last time that were not uh, fully addressed that I'll take the time to address now. Um, so there's a and one of them was indeed about the, whether the existence of a left adjoint is automatic or not. And there was a claim that it was. And it's justified by this theorem of a, a Adamek a Rosicki. Uh, uh, they call it, it's called reflection principle. So if C is a presentable category, uh, which it used to be called locally presentable. Um, but and if D is a full subcategory, so it's a, it's a version of an adjoint functor theorem. Uh, closed under all limits. Now that's the condition under which you might reasonably expect a left adjoint to the inclusion. But um, there are set theoretic technicalities that get in the way in general. Um, but if you also, uh, plus, uh, there exists a regular cardinal, kappa, such that D is closed under all kappa filtered colimits, um, so if kappa is the first infinite cardinal, so well, if not, then this is the just the just kappa filtered colimits is just filtered colimits. But if you make kappa bigger, it's a it's a weaker condition that it be closed under kappa filtered colimits. Um, so, but uh, uh, then then uh, D is presentable, uh, and there exists a left adjoint. Okay, so this is nice. In the okay, the thing was, and what about the derived uh, category? <laughs> and <laughs> um, the infinity category version 
uh, is proved by uh, Raghunov uh, Schlunk. Uh, let me make sure I got the name completely correct. Uh, yeah, Ragimov. I'm so sorry. Ragimov. I'm so sorry. Ragimov Schlank. Yeah, but you have to. The, there was some <coughs> circular thing I see in one of the discussions. I don't remember exactly that. If you want the reservation under limit, it is, let's say, infinite. Let me make another remark concerning a technical point that came up <laughs> in the last talk. So recall that we, we were discussing the derived analog of this, and in this context of this definition, we made the definition uh, that we define the derived category of R as a full subcategory of the derived category of, you know, uh, mod R triangle, let's say, let's just write derived category of R triangle, um, consists of those M in here, such that uh, on homology, you lie in this abelian category, mod R, for all I. And we wanted to show that this derived category satisfies the analogs of all of these conditions, in particular, these closure properties under limits and colimits. And for proving limits, the, the thing to prove is to prove closure under products. And there was a sticking point that came up that we needed uh, that if, uh, say, M alpha, alpha, and A is a collection of elements of objects in mod R, we needed that um, if you take, if you view them now in the derived category concentrated in degree zero and you take the product in the derived category, then it should satisfy this condition. And the subtlety is that infinite products Countable infinite products are exact in our setting of light condensed abelian groups, but arbitrary infinite products are not. So the product functor has right derived functors. And you need that this lies in mod R for all I. Yeah. Um, OK, but, but this can be proved as follows uh, from the axioms. But consider, but note, uh, so, but set uh, M to be the direct sum over alpha and A of M alpha then this guy is a retract of Ri product alpha in A m. Because term-wise, it's obviously, you know, this, sis this system is a retract of, of this system here. Um, but this is just the same thing as x internal x to i uh, uh, from direct sum of copies of our triangle to M. Ah, okay. And what about product <laughs> of uh, infinite complexes, unbounded below complexes? Yeah, the argument given in the last lecture, I mean, this, this was treated in the last lecture. Ah, because they are, they are uh, except, I mean, kind of, they, it's a personal complete limit, yeah. Yeah. so that you can reduce the countable case yes. into this one. Exactly. Okay. Ah, so that's, that's uh, and I think also that, I don't know, maybe you know the reference, so if you have in general a Grotendieck category and a Grotendieck subcategory, they closed under uh, colim uh, all close under kernel, co kernel, and filter, and co uh, direct sum, and direct sum. But then, in the derived category, when you consider the object with cohomology or homology groups, lies in the subcategories, and this is also presentable. Okay. This, this, is, this, I think, can be shown, but I don't know, I don't know the, ref the reference for this. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, but this yeah. is just an elementary thing. Uh -huh. and com you can, can do it in the level yeah. of complexes, and I think this can be used to, to give a less. I mean, once you know this, which actually one can formulate it in terms of every complex, you kind of a limit of small ones with some bound. Or yeah. So this, and then, then probably this can slide this well. Yeah, I don't think, yeah. To, to, to this, without using the... I don't think it's necessary to use this. I mean, actually, you can kind of explicitly construct the left to join on the derived level just by taking left derived functors of the, um, the left to joint you have on the abelian level. Well, maybe it doesn't quite work like that, but you can, well... 
yeah, I, I, I'm willing to, I'm very much willing to believe that the infinity categorical version can be, uh, can be um, avoided. Anyway, let's. Sure. Peter? You can press so that the D of R things be. You can You can press so that the D of R things be presentable. Because here we're just arguing that all the HI of M's lines went to subcategories, so just like. Oh, right, 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 right. Well, yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good argument. Yeah, because this is not necessarily the derived category of of mod R, but what Peter said was that um, there's a general principle about like, uh, like presentable categories being closed under limits in the category of categories as long as you have functors that commute with colimits and the homology functors commute with colimits. So the, then you can see that that this thing has to be presentable, and then the infinity categorical adjoint functor theorem, the more naive version proved by Lurie, um, would give you the left adjoint. Okay, anyway, enough of that, right? Uh, let's move on to some real math. Um, okay, so... And uh, when you did before without uh, light, you did everything. Uh, yeah. So is there a, a close relation between the notions in the light and the general set of that is so a condensed ring in the light gives you one in the general, and the subcategory gives a subcategory, and so on. Or maybe, or it is more twisted. Well, the the first statement is com is completely accurate. So light condensed rings embed fully faithfully into all condensed rings. But when it comes to the analytic ring structure, it's a little bit more it's a little bit more subtle. Um, yeah, because you a priori, if you have a light, an analytic ring in the light sense, you've a priori, a priori only decided what the free module should be on light condensed sets. And um, okay, so uh, we also in the previous lecture we also um, discussed some examples of analytic ring structures in the solid context. So let's say we have a, a solid uh, solid ring. So i use this notation. Uh, so it's a condensed ring whose underlying um, condensed abelian group happens to be solid. Um, and then we had this uh, subset of power bounded elements. Um, and then for any subset R plus contained in the power bounded elements, and maybe I'll say that one lies in the subset, um, we get an analytic ring structure. Um, on R, uh, denoted uh, like this. R triangle R plus solid, and um, well, as the as the notation indicates, the underlying condensed ring is just our ring R triangle, and then the category of modules uh, um, uh, such that if you look at the this space of null sequences in M. Um, and you have an endomorphism from this to itself given by 1 minus shift times f. Uh, this should be an isomorphism for all uh, f in R uh, plus. And let me make a remark. Uh, so. So the, the condition that 1 is in R plus ensures that <coughs> uh, every, every M in mod R is actually solid, is in solid Z. That was actually, so if you plug in F equals 1, that was our definition of solid Z. Um, and then uh, this condition that R plus is contained in R0, that's what gives that uh, the ring itself is complete, so to speak. So I recall that the interpretation of this uh, second coordinate in the analytic ring structure was that it's specifying some notion of complete modules ad adapted to whatever situation, and you kind of want the ring itself to be complete, otherwise you would complete it. Um, 
and that's a, so that's the condition on power bounded elements by definition just translates to saying that the the underlying ring itself should be complete which was one of our required axioms um, and another remark is that there's no loss of generality uh, that uh, R plus uh, is an integrally closed subring uh, with uh, containing all the topologically nilpotent elements. Um, because we saw that, um, well, that if you have a, a solid analytic ring structure, on a solid ring, so meaning an analytic ring structure such that every module over it is solid uh, as an underlying abelian group, then the collection of F for which this is an isomorphism for all M uh, is actually an integrally closed subring containing all the topologically nilpotent elements. So you could always just throw in this, these guys, take the subring generated by them, and take the integral closure, and that will not change the theory. Um, okay. And then there was an example uh, so if uh, if this is a Huber pair, so recall that that means this is a, a Huber ring uh, or let no, sorry, sorry excuse me, sorry, I'm going to uh, rephrase. Um, if so, so it's a Huber ring, um, and those things can always be considered as solid condensed rings, uh, just by taking the associated condensed ring. Um, then, uh, so then the integrally closed subrings. Uh, R plus uh, like this are the same thing as as open uh, integrally closed subrings uh, like this, and these are exactly uh, the a the R pluses in in Huber's theory. So the general setup we have for an arbitrary solid ring of the possible choices of R plus, when you specialize to the case of a Huber ring, it recovers exactly the the, the choices of R plus you have in Huber's theory. It is complete Huber ring. Yes, thank you. Yes, I let me say that from now on, whenever I say Huber ring, I'll mean complete Huber ring unless otherwise specified. So. So there is also sometimes people use so-called derived complete things. And if you have a derived complete thing, it also seems to give a, a condensed uh, stack thing. And then it's also, is it possible to say that this is also a solid? Yes, yes, yes. Actually, I think I might, I was, I was considering talking about that. There's a fun story with that, that maybe I'll talk about it later in the lecture. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but yes, the answer is yes. Um, uh, right, uh, and moreover, in this case, the R plus is actually recovered from, recovered by uh, the analytic ring. Uh, is it, well, it's basically equivalent to the, uh, you know, yeah. So the so Huber's R R plus, or I should say, R triangle R plus, is exactly the same thing as this solid analytic ring structure. So in the general case, I didn't quite claim that uh, if you start with an, I didn't claim, and it's probably not true, that if you start with an integrally closed subring satisfying these conditions and you form that theory, there might, for some other reasons, also be other things that F that satisfy this property for all your M, possibly. But in the Huber case, you can show that, that no, there aren't. Not we did not do it, or we did do it? Well, maybe we didn't do it last lecture, but it was done in a, a previous uh, lecture. So it, it, the, the argument is in the, is in the, the analytic.pdf. Okay, I noticed that I downloaded it. 
I mean, the second to last lecture, I think. Yeah. OK. Questions? So now we're going to discuss uh, localization. So, um, uh, so let me make a remark. Uh, so localization. So I'll start with a remark, which might be a bit uh, shocking at first glance, but it's actually trivial. Um, so if R is a R is a solid ring. So and then we have so R plus. Satisfying these conditions, and again, you can fr feel free to assume it's an integrally closed subring containing the topologically nilpotent elements. Um, note that this condition defining the analytic ring structure is just uh, a condition that you're imposing for all f in R plus, and R plus was by definition a subset of the underlying discrete ring R. So. Um, all the, the data that you're using to define the analytic ring structure actually already appears at the discrete level. So uh, then get another pair. Uh, just the, with the same R plus. And the power bounded elements in the discrete case are just, uh, are just all the elements. So certainly it's still going to be power bounded inside there. Um, and this argument shows that, uh, or this observation shows that if you you're interested in solid modules over your original R R plus, um, oh, sorry R R plus solid, well you can take the ones over where you have a discrete ring, uh, and then that already has all of the uh, the information about the analytic ring structure, and all that remains is to observe that. <coughs> R will be a commutative algebra object in here, and you just kind of abstractly take R modules uh, in this abelian category. So it's important to note that since we're doing condensed modules, even when you have a discrete ring, you have a huge amount of new modules besides the discrete modules you can consider. And in particular, over this discrete condensed ring, you have R, the honest condensed ring, and the theory for an arbitrary R is actually base changed from the discrete case in this completely naive way. OK, um, so we're going to discuss localization, so how kind of uh, how these categories glue. But it's actually going to be sufficient to treat the discrete case. Because if you understand how this category glues, then you can just put the R module structure on top of that, and you'll understand how this category glues. Um, and I want to stress from the beginning that I'm talking just about one kind of example of gluing. I'm not claiming this is the most general, um, but it is, uh, uh, it is nonetheless quite general. Um, but it's just a, a certain framework for gluing, you can call it. Um, so now uh, let me make an analogy. Uh, so, well, so we're going to be in the world of discrete rings now, but uh, so if R is a commutative ring, uh, then we have its usual derived category of R modules. So this is usual. 
of, and I'll, for emphasis, I'll put discrete R modules. Um, this localizes on over uh, the Zariski spectrum of R. And I'll, I'll say more precisely what that means in a second, but just, uh, and, um, and, and what is this spec R? Well, it's, uh, yeah, and so spec R, the set of prime ideals, Um, and the, there's a, a basis of quasi-compact opens closed under finite intersection. These are the, uh, the so-called distinguished opens. Something called principal. Principal, uh, principal opens? So, well, it depends on, I don't know. I've seen the principal in some references, but it is not, I'm not sure uh, what it. What do you prefer? I, I don't know because uh, <laughs> actually myself, I didn't remember. I remember sometimes I said basic open because I did not know, but then I saw in some textbooks it was principal, but I don't know how standard it is. Are you okay with distinguished open? Okay. okay. Uh, distinguished opens, so let's say uh, UF, uh, those are set of prime ideals P such that F is not in P, so F maps to something non-zero in the residue field. Um, and um, there's a structure sheaf so, and its, its value on this distinguished open uh, is so this ring R1 over F, localize at F, and it's kind of important to note that the Neither u f nor r one over f kind of determine f, right? So, but they they do determine each other, um, uh, and in, and in fact, uh, this u f actually gets identified with spec uh, of r one over f, and this matches up uh, up distinguished opens. Um, and then, um, so if, if this is an inclusion of distinguished opens, uh, sorry, well, sorry, 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 sorry. Um, so if you distinguished open, uh, to this, we can assign uh, the derived category of the value of the structure sheaf on u. Um, and if u is, uh, if v is contained in u, then you get a base change functor. Uh, and then the theorem, uh, completely classical, I guess, uh, is that um, this sheaf, or this pre-sheaf, uh, is a sheaf. No, that's true, yeah. So it's a sheaf of infinity categories. Um, so, well, in, the, in this setting, you also have a sheaf of abelian categories. I could have told the same story with the uh, mod, the usual abelian. Of abelian category. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah. Okay, but this is, but. But also there is a subtlety of a sheet of a hyper cover versus check cover. <coughs> it's true in both senses, but... Yes, that's right. So this is proved in, in Lurie somewhere, or where is it proved? I assume it's proved in Lurie somewhere, yeah. Uh, but, but people sometimes don't know exactly, okay, it's kind of... In, in this language, I'm sure it's, uh, it's Lurie, yeah. Uh, so um, I'll, I'll explain the argument in a second, but... Um, Right, so let me, so, in the, yeah, in this case, we also have a sheaf on the level of abelian categories, and even more, as Gabber says, a hyper sheaf, but uh, never mind that. Um, I just want to warn you that in the setting I'm about to discuss, dis to discuss here, we, we will only get a sheaf on the level of derived categories. We won't get a sheaf on the level of abelian categories. And the basic problem uh, is one that uh, came up in my, my previous lecture. So, 
uh, in this situation, the localization maps are flat. So O of u going to O of v uh, is a flat map. Well, it's just a localization. And so if, if you have a derived statement, then uh, using the flatness of localization, it's not too difficult to deduce an abelian statement. But in the setting I'm about to discuss, um, these localization maps will not, in general, be flat. And I kind of, uh, so one example of such a localization map is going to be this localization from the affine line to the closed unit disk, which was this T solidification or ZT solidification. And I already mentioned that it's not exactly T exact. It, there's a, a discrepancy by one. And that abs actually uh, obstructs uh, the, um, uh, the sheaf condition on the abelian level. So this corner of the closely related statement. So one yeah. statement is that the derived category of a ring is the same as the quasi-coherent derived category <laughs> of spec of the ring. And I think in general, the sound bounded this is proved the problem in the Stax project. Okay. And then there is another statement about the shift property, which I, and I also don't know the reference, but I think that people, that it is on this line of Lurie thing that you have, if you have any ring topos, then you can associate to every object in the site or the topos the derived category of uh, of this uh, u of u, and this should also be a hyper shift. But is it? What do you, is it? Uh, so this this is in Uluri also. Or, uh, so first of all, what I said should be correct. I think is it. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, my brain is a little not working very well right now. I actually I actually zoned out while you were talking. My apologies. Yeah. Any topos? Yeah. And you have you associate any object u yeah. the right category of the topos restricted to u with yeah. values in the sheet. Yes. That this is a hypersheaf. Hypersheaf? No, sheaf, yeah. Hyper, and also a hypersheaf. Well, why, why would it automatically be a hypersheaf? Uh, no. No, I think I was able to, to do it in some classical, more classical formulation, but it's. it's uh, mm. Is it. So, what do you know about uh, this statement? Uh, oh, yeah, you, the usual derived category. Uh, maybe, it is, maybe it is a hypersheaf, yeah, okay. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. You don't know the reference. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know the statement. It's, I guess now that I think about it, it sounds plausible. But I mean, the hypersheaf. But there's a, certainly Lurie proves it's a sheaf, yeah. And hypersheaf maybe. I don't, I don't think. He proves it in one of his books. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Because there is also something that I saw that you mentioned. I mean, in some text that I found on the internet, that instead of looking at the drive category, you can look at functors, uh, infinity functors, uh, or shifts. Of these values in D of a billion group on the uh -huh. side, yeah, and you claim that this is the same as the derived category of the ring side. Oh, hypersheaves, hypersheaves, yeah. If you do hypersheaves with values in D of a billion groups, that's the same thing as the derived category of the category of sheaves of a billion groups, yeah. Oh. Ah, and this is also but proved in, uh, in. I assume it's somewhere in Lurie, yeah. Okay. Well, I, now, uh, I'd, I'd like to move on. So we, maybe we have this discussion uh, at another time. Um, OK, so that's uh, one part of the analogy, kind of. Uh, and the second part is. Uh, so now we have uh, R, R plus, a discrete Huber pair. So that just means R is an ordinary commutative ring, and R plus is an integrally closed subring. Um, well, then we've assigned to this, uh, this D, R, R plus solid. Um, and the claim is that this localizes on something else, on the evaluative spectrum of this pair, R, R plus. Um, OK, so what is this? So, so that was the set of prime ideals. And the, the kind of purpose of a prime ideal in this setting is to let you know where functions vanish or don't vanish. So kind of, you could think of it that way. So it's kind of a binary condition of whether you're, you're zero or non-zero. And in the 
Validative spectrum, uh, you are allowed some more refined information, not just information about whether a given function vanishes or doesn't, but given two functions, you can ask whether one is, is bigger than the other. Uh, um, and the, the way you can measure that is by means of evaluation. So, so, so it's a, a, f a function from R to gamma union zero. So this is an abelian group. Uh, written multiplicatively, multiplicatively, um, and then there are axioms. So multiplicativity, v f g equals v f v g, and there's the obvious rule about zero times anything equals zero. Um, there is the non-Archimedean condition, v f plus g uh, is less than or equal to maximum of v f v g. Ordered, thank you. Thank you. It's ordered, but the order is reversed when you pass on multiplicative. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, but thank you, thank you, yes. Um, uh, v of 0 equals 0 and V of 1 equals 1. And then we involve the subring R plus, so we ask that all of these uh, kind of be integral with respect to the valuation. Um, so maybe VF for all F in R plus. And then there's an equivalence relation. <laughs> On valuations, because you could always, for example, enlarge the enlarge the ordered abelian group in some arbitrary way without really changing what's going on. And one way to describe this equivalence relation is uh, that so uh, so v is equivalent to w if and only if for all f and g in R uh, we have v of f less than or equal to v of g if and only if w of f is less than or equal to w of g. So um, so in other words, that what's really important about evaluation is this binary relation on functions, which is how, you know, testing whether one is bigger than the other. Is it the same in this case? Is it the same as SPA in the sense? Oh, it's also SPA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, because the continuity condition is vacuous when the, the ring is discrete. Yeah. Um, OK, that's a bit of a mouthful if you've never seen it before. There's another perspective on these things that maybe explains exactly in what sense it's bigger than spec R is. Um, when, uh, value, this is also the same thing as uh, uh, just a pair of a prime ideal and then um, sort of, uh, evaluation subring, so evaluation domain in the residue field. So you have the information which records whether your function vanishes or not, and then you have this extra information saying when uh, a function or a fraction of functions uh, where the denominator doesn't vanish uh, should be less than or equal to 1, basically. And that's the same thing as, uh, as this. Yeah, thank you. Yes, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, off, you can see the relation domain off, okay. Yeah. Um, containing A plus. Thank you. Yes, containing R plus. The image of R plus. Yeah, thank you. Yes, R plus. Uh, right. OK. Um, so the, the point here is that we, now we have a much bigger category, and there's more flexibility for how to localize. And um, it connects with this classical discussion of valuations. So if you've never seen this before, then uh, you know you can look, for example, at a I don't know, like the rash, rational numbers or something. Then maybe it's maybe you know the classification of valuations. There's the trivial valuation, um, which I guess corresponds to equality here. For every prime ideal, you have the trivial valuation where it's zero if uh, your element is zero and one. Uh, zero if your element lies in the prime ideal and, and one otherwise. But then also for every prime, prime p, you have a p-adic valuation. So you have generic point of spec z, you have the special points of spec z, but then you have these things in between, which kind of are nearby p but not equal to p, these p-adic valuations. Um, uh, oh, sorry, I was talking about z, not q. Um, and then, but then the fact that you can classify those is kind of um, it's a little bit misleading because once you add an extra variable, then all of a sudden uh, uh, <laughs> things explode. And there's many different kinds of valuations, basically, because you, in a surface, you can have lots of different kinds of curves passing through a given point. And 
Uh, you have valuations of so-called higher rank, which introduce additional complications into the theory. Um, so I'm not going to go too much into, into this, but yeah. So I'll, I'll stick to mostly formal aspects for now. Um, OK, so let's continue the table of analogies. So, um, so there, there we had spec R, and we had this particularly nice basis for the topology, quasi-compact, closed under finite intersections. And each of them was also of the same form as the global guy, just for a different input datum, so R1 over F. And we have the same thing here. So we have a basis of quasi-compact opens uh, closed under finite intersection. And these are called the rational opens in this case. And they're, uh, they dep depend on a choice of some elements in your ring. So you choose arbitrarily F1, Fn, and G uh, inside your ring. Then you can form this thing. And what is it? It's the set of those valuations V uh, satisfying all of these conditions, such that moreover, so V of G is non-zero, and uh, V of Fi is less than or equal to V of G for all i. So in some sense, it lives inside the Zariski op the distinguished open, the Zariski open given by just deciding G should be non-zero. And then we use this extra flexibility of we can also impose inequalities. So we're shrinking this risky open a little bit using some inequalities. And we still get an open subset. Um, OK, continuing. So, uh, so there's a structure. There, there actually, is, there's a structure sheaf, but actually there are structure sheaves. So, uh, on this F1, Fn over G, uh, you have one thing which just takes the algebraic Zariski localization, um, but then you also get a choice of integral elements. Um, and that you get by it's going to be a, it has, it's going to be a subring of here, and you get it by taking uh, the integral elements you had before, or rather their image in there, and then a joint, and then looking at also at uh, these elements f1 over g, fn over g, and then that might not be integrally closed, so you take the integral closure. So basically, you just uh, just look at all of the elements, uh, all of the elements which the valuations in your open subset think should be less than or equal to 1. So you've kind of already have it for this by fiat, and you forced it for these. And then the collection of those things is an integrally closed subring. So um, you have it for all of those guys. Um, and then again, you have this nice recursive property that uh, u of f1 fn over g uh, is just the same thing as the valuative spectrum of o u o plus u. And this matches up rational opens. And here is another place you can see the kind of necessity of including the data of this R plus in the general theory. Because if you, you I mean, you could have said, OK, well, I, I, uh, I want a bigger space. I'll leave out this condition. Why should I ask for it? But then you define these rational open subsets, and they will no longer be of the form SPVR for some ring R, because you've forced certain elements, these elements Fi over G, to be less than or equal to 1. And the abstract ring, R1 over G, doesn't remember that. So if you want this condition that the rational opens themselves should be of the same form as the global object, then it's absolutely necessary to include this extra data of R plus from the start. Uh, so, of course, this, uh, okay, uh, implicitly, so this implies that when, when rational, well, rational open, including the other, you say that this, uh, there are marks on this, but what, what is the statement matches up rational open? What do you mean that? I mean that the, so there's a, 
a continuous map from uh, this to this. And uh, it induces a bijection, the pullback, say, induces a bijection between rational opens in here, which are contained in this open subset, and rational opens in here. Ah, okay, I know this. Rational open of a rational open is a rational open. Okay, I remember it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, and then. Uh, The theorem, uh, ah, well, maybe, no, I should say again, okay, so U, a rational open, to that we can attach uh, D of O U, O plus U, solid. Uh, let me, I'll put this, I'll put this on. Um, and then if uh, U is contained in V, uh, inclusion, uh, then we get the pullback map. Huh. Well, there's a, in fact, there's a, it comes from a map of analytic rings. from uh, O U, O U plus, O plus U uh, solid to uh, O V, O plus V solid. In the sense of the previous lecture, so we have a map of condensed rings, which is just in this case a map of discrete rings, such that if you have a complete module here, then when you restrict scalars, it's also complete here. So that's the kind of forgetful functor, um, and then that always has a left adjoint, which is this base change functor. And explicitly, you get it by taking your module here, uh, abstractly tensoring up from this ring to this ring, and then recompleting in this theory here. That's this base change functor. Um, and then the theorem, oh, well, I've kind of run out of space, but maybe I'll put it, so. Uh, this pre-sheaf, that one over there, uh, is a sheaf of infinity categories. And I'll put the warning that so this is not true on abelian level. In contrast uh, to classical case. Uh, these these pullback functors uh, uh, functors are not t exact in general because the pullback involves a solidification a t solidification which as I said is not a not a flat operation. Does it have bounded the uh, homological dimension or not? Uh, yes, it does. Yeah, so it's bound. It'll be bounded by. Uh, N. The solidification is bounded by N. I mean, yeah, yeah. the homology is zero up above N. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think we'll take a five minute break um, before I get to the proofs. Proof. Is it hyper complete or not? Um, probably not in general. But there's an abstract result that if, so that if your space uh, has finite crawl dimension, then hypercompleteness is automatic. This is sometimes useful. So if I start with uh, a solid ring, and then I can take its underlying set, and which I in that way discrete topology, and we mentioned it's the same as module versus thing. Yeah. And is there cases it's actually idempotent of this thing? I guess an idempotent algebra. Or? And um, there, are, uh, no, I don't think so. So the things these tend, to, I mean, so for example, like I don't know, z. So we 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 showed that z power series t is idempotent over z polynomial t, but 
I mean, this, this, discre this discrete ring is, is going to be way too big, if, uh, I think. Yeah. So, I mean, th th like, this is not going to be idempotent. There's no extra reason why this should be. I mean, I, I didn't think about it carefully, but I would assume the answer is no. What's that? Right, right, right. So let's, um, so, mm, so I've, just, I've stated the theorem, um, and now I want to uh, explain the proof. Um, but uh, to motivate it, I'll give a, a, a certain proof of this classical theorem here. And I, there's, so there's many, actually in the, this classical case, there's many different possible arguments um, for this. Um, especially because these localizations are flat, there's lots of flexibility in how you set things up. Um, but I want to describe a particular argument for this claim here, which will uh, kind of translate over without too much difficulty to, to this case here. So, but maybe I, I erase some boards. Um, I don't know. Uh, so. Uh, there was maybe one remark that one can make in both settings that I forgot to make. Uh, so I said, so I defined a, um, I defined this pre-sheaf of infinity categories on this rational opens. Okay, not every open subset is rational, they're just a basis for the topology, but there's this general result. And when you have a, a basis for the topology closed under finite intersections, that condition being actually necessary in the infinity context, um, <coughs> then a sheaf on the basis uniquely uh, extends to a sheaf on the whole space in kind of the naive manner of have an arbitrary open, you take limits. Um, yeah, so we're only describing this sheaf of categories on the rational opens, but after the fact you get also a category attached to an arbitrary open whether or not it's rational. Okay, um, so proof of of classical theorem. So, meaning uh, descent, Zariski descent, you could call it, uh, for D of R. Um, so you can start with the, so we're, we're, in, we're interested in this, uh, you could say this, this site of uh, distinguished opens inside spec R. So we have this with the open cover topology. And there is, um, and so we, we kind of have an understanding in, of what it means for, uh, to have a cover. Um, you know, the distinguished opens cover a ring if and only, uh, cover a spec of a ring if and only if the, you know, if you're, you're inverting some elements and those elements should generate the unit ideal. Um, but you can do a series of reductions actually which will show you that you only need to sh check the sheaf condition for very specific, a very specific example of such a, a situation. So the, the lemma is that uh, this Grotendieck topology is generated by covers of the following form. So you take U uh, spec R a distinguished open, you take an element of the structure sheaf on U, and you form the cover, uh, which is <coughs> uh, U of F and U of 1 minus F uh, covering U. So this is a very simple example of two elements which generate the unit ideal uh, inside this ring. And then the, the claim is if you want to check something as a sheaf, you only need to check the sheaf condition in this one specific situation. Yeah, this was originally a coherence proof of the... Okay, it doesn't... 
anyway, it's easy, but it was, there was something of Quillen when he proved the cell conjecture, which was... Okay. We reduce this to, the, I mean, you want to prove that uh, 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 if you have some vector bundle on a fine space over a ring, which is driven over a local ring, then it is extended <laughs> from the ring, and he did it by reducing to this, and it was a bit tricky. Yeah, Quillen's a clever guy. So let's give the proof. Um, so, well, well I, as I said, you, you know, we know you can describe algebraically the covers. So if you, if you in, in general, the covers would be described like this. You take F1 up in Fn in, in O of U generating the unit ideal, so such that there exists x1, xn in O of U with uh, x1, f1, plus dot, 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 plus x n f n equals one. Then the general co the, the general cover is the uh, u of uh, f i. Uh. Ooh, darn it! I can't believe I didn't think of that. Will not be okay because you cannot generate the empty cover, the empty set from non-empty things. Damn it! I, for I can't believe I forgot to check those things. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> I should know better by now, but um, uh, plus empty cover <laughs> of empty set. OK, checking the sheaf condition there just means you check that the value of your sheaf on the empty set is the terminal object in the category that is the target of your sheaf. OK, so that usually can be done without much difficulty. Um, OK. Any? Was there a, uh, a question or comment from Bon? No, OK. Um, but note that uh, this cover here is, uh, but, this is, but this cover is refined by another cover, uh, where you take fi times xi. So this is a smaller distinguished open. Um, and those still generate the unit ideal because, because of the same expression. Uh, so, so then we can assume just that uh, f1 plus dot 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 plus fn is equal to 1. Um, and then you can do an induction on n. So you can then induct on n. So. Let's say, for example, you had uh, f1 plus f2 plus f3 equals 1, and you want to check the sheaf condition. Uh, then because you're assuming the sheaf condition for covers of this form, you can localize uh, to uh, you know, u of f1 plus f2 and uh, u of f3. And it's enough to check the sheaf condition when you do these localizations. But when you localize to here, then f1 plus f2 is equal to a unit. and by dividing by the, or mu multiplying by the inverse of the unit, you reduce to that case there. Um, and then when f3 is a unit, um, uh, well, there's something similar, right? Uh, f uh. Well, first, there is a statement about generation of the Golden topology. Ah, sorry, wait. Golden topology containing this. And then there is this another statement which is probably lowered that under some conditions that it's enough to check the shift condition on generators of on coverage to generate topology yes, and the yes. base changes. Yes, yes, yes. Of yes. course, assuming that things like the intersections exist. And yes, exactly. But the, yeah, I chose this collection to be compatible under base change. So that, um, yeah, so I mean, this, this collection here is closed under base change. So that, that is an important technical point when you get into making this argument completely precise, but I, I set it up so that it's true. Oh yeah, and sorry, when you restrict your cover to this, the cover is split. I mean, the, because uh, this was one of your covering elements. So the, the chief condition is automatic here. And the chief condition here follows by induction. So um, that's, that's basically the, the argument, fairly simple. Um, Okay, 
So, but what about this case here? Um, okay, so what are we trying to show? So, in now, so checking the sheaf condition uh, for. Uh, well, I can. It's a distinguished open in an element f, but I, there's no now. Now there's no loss of generality in assuming u equals spec r. So, uh, um, <coughs> so well. So what is the sheaf condition in this case? So in this case we have. Uh, well, we have just two elements, and then we have their intersection. So the sheaf condition says that if you look at the derived category of R, and then the derived category of R1 over F, the derived category of R1 over 1 minus F, um, and then the derived category on their intersection, which is you invert both, uh, th this should be a pullback of infinity categories. Um, and now let me make a pause because I didn't spend much time discussing what this notion means, like sheaf of infinity categories, limit of infinity categories, and so on. But I can make it completely, so to speak, elementary in this case of these pullbacks so that you get a feel for what, what the claim is. So, yeah, so claiming that this is a pullback of infinity categories, what does it mean concretely? Well, you have a, it means the functor from D of R to the pullback category. Uh, Uh, should be an equivalence of, of categories. So now how, how to think of this infinity category? Well, so you give yourself an object in the derived category here and an object in the derived category here, and then you give yourself extra data of an isomorphism between them here. Um, and that's, uh, but it's not, an, it's not, it's not an isomorphism in the usual derived category, it's an isomorphism in some infinity version. So you could imagine, for example, if this is represented by a complex of projective objects, this is represented by a complex of projective objects, then you'd actually want to give a chain homotopy equivalence uh, between their images there. Let's, let, me, let me say they're bounded above just for simplicity. And then you make an infinity category out of that, so you define some notion of chain homotopy there and so on. Um, uh, right, so then what is... Uh, essential surjectivity mean, it means you can glue, glue in the derived category. If you have a chain complex here, a chain complex here, and an explicit identification between them, so maybe you choose some quasi-isomorphic models and make a chain homotopy equivalence between them, then that collection of data uniquely comes from an element here um, up to, you know, up to quasi-isomorphism. So the, the point being that you actually have to specify the data of the chain homotopy equivalence here in order to get the well-defined object there. That's the essential surjectivity. The fully faithfulness says something else. It says that if you have two objects here and you want to know the Homs between them, so you can think of calculating X groups, for example, so the R Homs between two objects here, you can get it by you base change here and you take R Homs, you base change here and you take R Homs, here and you take R Homs, and then you do a homotopy pullback of those complexes for R Homs you have there. Uh, which is the same thing as like a shift of a mapping cone of some direct sum of these two mapping to that. But is it so equivalent to like the drag criteria of the diagram that, that you can say in a abelian level, a module over a diagram is just giving module over every ring and maps, and then not necessarily without isomorphism, then you take the drag category with some imposing some conditional homology? Maybe. Uh, it sounds, sounds reasonable, but I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. That's certainly not how I think about it, but okay. Um, okay, so that's kind of how to think about this result. It's, it lets you glue objects that are defined locally in a derived sense, but it also lets you do global, if you can do global X calculations by localizing. Um, okay. Uh, but how do you now, how, how do you formally prove such a statement? So note that, so the proof, so note each base change function has a, a right adjoint uh, 
uh, which is just a forgetful functor, so from derived category of R1 over F to derived category of R. And then, then it, f so that's for each of the individual maps in this diagram, but then it actually follows formally that this functor uh, also has a right adjoint. Um, Uh, does too. And you can explicitly describe what this right adjoint is. So it sends, if you have a pair, so M, N, uh, alpha. So alpha is an isomorphism. So M is a module here, N is a module here, and alpha is an isomorphism between their common base changes. Uh, then you just take, you apply the right adjoints to each of these objects and then you take a limit. So you just take m cross over n with uh, m1 over f, which is the same thing as n1 over 1 minus f. Yeah, you have to open up Lurie and find the precise version, and, but it works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so, so, so uh, the trick to get used to convert by two open uh, uh, is it just to have a uh, easier, uh, easier diagram? Yes, uh, yes, 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 yes. In principle, you could, you could also do this argument with, without doing the reduction. Yeah, yeah. That's correct. But it's cer certainly easier to talk about. <laughs> ah, okay, because you're finitely many intersections, just using intersections. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. yeah, I think uh, I think in the um, once you get to this the, the statement we're trying to prove with the evaluative spectrum, then you really probably don't want to. Um, well, I don't know. Maybe uh, you could probably organize it cleverly, but I think doing the reductions makes it much easier. So, um, okay, right. Oh, so so and this is good news. <laughs> I mean, this is the great thing about proving something as a sheaf of categories. It's like. Uh, you have, a, you have an automatic candidate for the inverse. It's some right adjoint. So you have a functor you want to prove is uh, uh, an equivalence. You have a right adjoint. That means you have a unit and a co-unit. You need to check our isomorphisms. So then you need to check. So one of them will be a map in this category, and one of them will be a map in this category. Um, so, <coughs> so, so for example, for the unit, uh, you need that if m is in D of R, uh, you need that m, uh, m1 over f, uh, m1 over 1 minus f, m1 over f1 minus f, uh, that this is a pullback. So that would be the claim that the unit of the adjunction is a, an isomorphism. Um, and um, so this so this follows from uh, the statement that if uh, if you have any element, let me call it n in D of R, uh, such that n one over f uh, equals n one over one minus f equals zero, uh, then n equals zero. So you want to test something as a homotopy pullback, you can measure the difference between this and the homotopy pullback by a mapping cone. And that object, you can check with this, um, will satisfy this condition, and then you want to conclude that the object itself is zero. Um, and then, well, this is, well, this is, for, for example, now you could reduce to the abelian level because an object is zero if and only if its homology is zero, and these are localizations that are flat. So it reduces to the same claim on the abelian level, which is kind of very easy to check. Um, and then the, the, that was, the, that was the, for the unit, and the co-unit uh, is the, it actually reduces to the exact same claim again. Um, but what, so, um, so that's kind of the proof. But I want to point out what's, uh, what's formally used. Okay, so you use it localization by F, Somehow, and this right adjoint commute that is. I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it over. 
Um, so each uh, base change is a localization. So the right adjoint is fully faithful. Um, uh, the localizations commute with each other. Just a sec, I'll say what it means. I'll say what it means. It means that if you take something which is local with respect to, say, this operation, so something on which 1 minus f acts invertibly, and then you uh, invert f on that, it'll 1 minus f will still act invertibly. Um, these are things which are all just obvious in this context, but I want to point out exactly what's being used in this argument. Um, and the third condition uh, was that, yeah, if, if m uh, maps to 0 on each, each element of cover, then m equals 0. So if you have a pullback diagram satisfying these uh, three properties, uh, then, and the, I mean, uh, yeah, and uh, then um, then you're gonna you're gonna automatically get this. Uh, I mean, a, a limit. I mean, a, a square like this satisfying these three properties, then you're automatically gonna get a pullback. Okay. Okay. So then the proof of the solid analog so implicitly, the, uh, you, you use the dr uh, when you invert f1 minus f is some of the intersection yes. of the two. Right, that right. Is, that is, those which are local yes. with respect to. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, you want to know that when you, yeah, exactly. You want to know that when you pass the right adjoints, this thing is just the intersection of those two things as well. Yeah, maybe I should have added that to the list. Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Well. But well, we have to understand it in a suitable way. I guess you're right. Uh, and of course, we have to know the language of Lowry to make it precise. Yes. So it's not balanced well, so maybe to. Well, I mean, it's a, it, the, the, the right adjoints are fully faithful, so it really is just kind of an object wise condition, you could say. Just, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So what's the analog? So. So again, we have uh, the site of rational opens, uh, u in this valuative spectrum. Um, and the Grotendieck topology open covers. And then we have a lemma that topology is generated by, uh, so the empty cover of the empty set And for all rational opens, and all f in O R, uh, now we have to take care of two different kinds of covers. So uh, we have u uh, f one uh, and u one f cover. Cover you. With the geometry that you have those two, yeah. Right, so the way you read this is, well, you read this f less than or equal to 1. So f should be integral. And the way you read this is that f is non-zero, but even more, it's f is bigger than or equal to 1. So it's, it's well away from 0. It's a complement of the open unit disk. Um, and uh, you, uh, <coughs> so then, uh, oh yeah, 1 over f. Uh, u, 
can do a 1 over 1 minus f. So this is, again, so again, this is where f is non-zero and you require f to be bigger than or equal to 1, and similarly here. So this is actually a refinement of the Zariski cover we had previously, um, where, you, where you just inverted f and 1 minus f, and that was a cover. This is a smaller a refinement of that, which still covers. And the last thing I think, when it's enough to do it when f is in R plus. OK. I don't think that'll be helpful, but uh, it's, that's nice to know. Yeah, it's like in written geometry, in Tate's original work, where he proved the cyclicity theorem. Yeah. He reduces to, he didn't have rational domains, but he has this uh, two, two types of covers for which you can prove a cyclicity. Yeah. And it turns out that it generalizes to the other case. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if, um, maybe in the Tate setting that uh, one can arrange that f is... No, in no, there, in there yeah. f is in, you need, because you have the, you call them Weierstrass and Laurent, and Weierstrass, no, not, not him, maybe some other people yeah. did read it. Anyway, then the Weierstrass is just f in uh, a0, I mean, in that case, a0 is a plus, I didn't know about plus initially, but I think that in Huber, the, okay, then I also wrote some letters to other people, sometimes to explain some. Okay. Um, so I will not give the argument for this, it's, it uses, well, it's, it's just, it's a bit more complicated because, well, the value of spectrum is more complicated than spec, but the idea is basically, well, the idea is somewhat similar, you could say, but it's actually a somewhat complicated argument, so, but it's, um... No, well, there is maybe a statement that it's enough to have a rational, that is, you have a rational, F1, Fn generating the unit ideal, and then you, it's enough to check do for those. Yes, 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 yes. And you can do some little bit of work to reduce to the. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yes, yeah. So, so Huber, so, so the, uh, maybe I'll yeah sketch. So based on what Gaber said, so Huber shows uh, every cover refine is refined by one of the following form. So take f one, f n generating the unit ideal. So. And then you look at u, f1 up to fn, but then you leave out fi, and you put it on the bottom instead. So then the collection of these, i and i. So again, it's a refinement of the usual Zariski cover you get when f1 through fn generate the unit ideal. But you can check just on valuations that it still, it still covers the, the valuative spectrum. Um, and then you do some kind of, you do something similar to what we did uh, previously. You have with this. This here, you can, using these covers, which refine all those risky covers, you can assume one of the elements is equal to one. Anyway, you keep playing and playing and playing, and eventually you get, you get the desired thing. Um, okay. Uh, right, so now what are we reduced to, analogous to there? So, so if R, R plus discrete Huber pair, and we take F uh, in R, um, then we need uh, that um, uh, well, Uh, right, so there's two, there's two different kinds of covers. There is the f over 1 and 1 over f. Um, and then, um, yeah. Uh, so I'll do that one first. Um, sorry, r, and then. Okay, so uh, solid, solid, solid. Uh, we need that, and we need the other one. So, uh, 
Um, Uh, we need that as well. Okay. Um, so we're going to basically just verify that all of these conditions hold. So So what is this? So there's only there's only really two types of covers here. If you look at it, there's the cover u f over one, and then there's the cover u one over f. This is of the form u one over f, where f is just one minus f. Um, so so if f in r, so what is this d r r plus uh, goes to d r one over uh, sorry let's say r r plus a joint f integrally closed. Um, this is just uh, solidification, uh, T solidification uh, for ZT goes to R, uh, T goes to F. Um, so by definition, uh, so these are both these are both analytic ring structures on the same ring, right? And uh, the only difference is here we've enforced extra conditions of, uh, of it's just by definition. So uh, if you have so here we have for all everything in R plus um, your solid with your T solid with respect to that variable, um, and here uh, well and if you enforce this, then you, you also have that condition not just for R plus but for F. But then we said you automatically then get it for the integrally closed subring generated by those. So then you exactly get this condition here. So the, the category that you're getting here is exactly this condition here. And the left adjoint is just the, the T solidification. Um, <coughs> and recall that this was given by some Arham. Uh, uh, Um, okay, that was the first type. At least need to invert f as first. Uh, sorry, do you at least to invert f as then you pass all. No, I'm, I'm not doing this. Sorry, I'm doing this one here. Yeah, so that, sorry. Thank you. So this is u of f over one, and then there's the one where u of one over f. Um, so that gives d r r plus uh, goes to d r one over f, and then r plus one over f in a row closed. Um, so what is this? This is so first invert t or first invert f, uh, then uh, t solidify uh, for uh, z t uh, t goes to one over f r one over f. So. The, the modules here are a full subcategory of R1 over F modules, which is a full subcategory of R modules. And the condition is F acts invertibly, and you have this extra thing that's supposed to be solid. Um, but now let me make a remark about that second situation. Uh, so I claim that that whole process, inverting F and then solidifying with respect to 1 over F, um, so that uh, base change there, is also described by just an Arham. So now, now I'm going to take ZT uh, mapping to R with T going to F, not 1 over F. Um, and I take Arham over ZT. Um, so Z power series T modulo uh, ZT uh, shifted by minus 1 there. So i.e., so and based on the formalism from two lectures ago, this is the localization which kills uh, the idempotent algebra, idempotent object, uh, 
z power series t uh, in mod or in, in dz t uh, z solid. So we had zt modules and solid z modules. We said that this was idempotent. And I also said that when you have an idempotent algebra, then when, when you, you can kill it by just taking the mapping cone of or homo homotopy fiber of the, the unit map hitting that thing and doing this Arham formula. D, Z, T, Z. This is what you call D. Uh, this was, yeah, this would be the same thing as D of modules over a Z bracket T in solid Z. Um, yeah. That's kind of, this is a kind of the new notation, fitting it in the general framework. Because before for, for <coughs> Huber pair, you wrote D, A, D, R, R plus. You did not write solid. No, no. You had uh, integrally closed. Ah, okay. You, you wrote uh, so, uh, D. So let me explain what the point is here. So. You, he, this localization is supposed to be given by first inverting f and then doing the solidification. But again, this solidification, is, yeah, but th the first claim is that this functor already inverts f. So if you have something f torsion, it's going to be killed by this. And the reason is you're killing this whole guy, and therefore, in particular, you're killing any module over this guy. But um, everything t torsion is a module over, over z power series t. So this automatically uh, inverts f because anything t torsion is a, a z power series t module. So if you have a solid abelian group, which is a filtered colimit of things killed by powers of t, then it is a z t module. That's just a condition. So you can to check it, you can it's a condition closed under limits and co-limits. So you can reduce to checking for something which is uniformly killed by some power of t, but then it's obviously a z power series t module because it's a module over the, the truncated power series ring. Um, so then it would be the same thing to write this formula where you invert t, but then you, if you, that's just uh, after a change of variables, it's exactly the same thing as T solidification as described by the, or T inverse solidification as described by the previous formula. So inverting F and then solidifying 1 over F is just the same thing as, as doing this here. Okay. Um, So basically, all you need to check now, if you look at those conditions, most of them we already know. So it's a localization, kind of by construction. The localizations commute, that's because they're both given by r homing out of some object. And any two functors r homing out of an object commute with each other just because of the tensor product by a junction and the tensor product being commutative. Um, so and then what does this translate to in terms of these uh, idempotent algebras which determine these localization functors? So 3 translates to, well, there's, it's a different condition in, okay, so, so for, uh, so. Um, it's just a, a sim it translates to a simple condition on these idempotent algebras here. So there's that one and then there's that one. Is that if you take z power series t and tensor it in solid z modules uh, over z t with z Laurent series t inverse, uh, you get zero. So if you have something that dies on r hom out of this and dies on r hom out of that, then by messing around, you will, using this condition, conclude that it just has to be zero. Um, and this is a Kind of, uh, yeah. So it's, you can use the geometric series to to see that this is zero. Uh, yeah. So what's the interpretation here? By the way, remember, like uh, 
So this, so this, you can think of this as localized away from the, the open unit disk. And this was localized uh, to um, localized to the closed unit disk, or away from the open unit disk centered at infinity. And the reason those two cover intuitively is because if you take the open unit disk and the closed unit disk, then, uh, or sorry, if you take the, sorry, if you take the closed unit disk centered at infinity and the closed unit disk centered at zero, then those union is the whole space, but in terms of the complements, that's saying if you take the open unit disk and the open unit disk at infinity, then they don't intersect. And that's exactly a, you know, this is the algebraic translation of that fact. Um, and then similarly, so for the second kind of cover, uh, you need that z power series t uh, tensor over z t uh, z power series uh, 1 minus t. Uh, you need this to be 0. Um, uh, but again, this is just uh, z power series t u and then 1 minus u plus t. Um, and that's also 0 for the same reason. And again, the interpretation is that the open unit disk centered at 0 intersect the open unit disk centered at 1. Uh, they don't intersect. And that sounds strange until you remember we're doing non-Archimedean geometry, and then it sounds reasonable again. Um, yeah. OK. Uh, all right. So I want to finish with just a couple of remarks. So, so remark, um, so there's the, the corollary so that if uh, R is any solid ring and then R plus containing one, I don't know, sure, uh, containing Um, so the uh, so now you have to be a little bit careful. So you go, so you, I could say that the d r r plus solid localizes on the value of spectrum of this discrete ring. Um, but be careful, uh, namely. So there is something that is formal, which is what I said, that okay, so uh, on the global sections, uh, that this thing is just R modules in uh, the category we assign to this discrete Huber pair. But if you then want to get a sheaf, uh, so then you send U, a rational open, you have to send that to modules, R modules in this uh, D O of U uh, discrete. Uh, uh, I don't, maybe I want to say, uh, uh, so, oh, uh, for the discrete ring, uh, uh, um, <coughs> so this doesn't recover the topology in the, in the general non-discrete topology, uh, okay. Yeah, so, um, so the, and in particular, so what is the unit object in this category? So uh, you take you take R, um, and then you invert G, and then you derive solidify uh, with respect to uh, F I all the F I over G's. So um, Necessarily, when you do this object for a completely general solid ring, um, you're going to end up with some derived phenomena here. Um, uh, and we'll, I, I was hoping to get to it today, but we'll probably discuss exactly how that happens later. Um, and I want to make, but I want to also make another remark, uh, which is that if, uh, so in fact, uh, this 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 sheaf, uh, so. D R R plus actually lives over, so it localizes on this big topological space for the discrete ring, but it actually lies over a much smaller subset. Uh, so, 
the closed subset. Uh, so let's say spov r star r plus uh, r. You, if you remember the set of topologically nilpotent elements, then here uh, you add the condition uh, that if f here is topologically nilpotent, uh, then you want the valuation to be strictly less than 1. Uh, so for an individual f, that's a closed subset, and then it's a big intersection of such things. That's a closed subset of this topological space. And my claim is just that if you take this sheaf of categories and you restrict it to the open complement, you just get 0. So it's really living over this closed subset here. Um, On the other hand, so Huber uh, studies, Huber considers uh, spa r, r plus, um, which is the continuous valuations. Um, which are less than or equal to 1 on r plus. And that's the same thing as, uh, so sub the subset of, of this, it's a, sm a, a potentially smaller subset, a generally smaller subset, uh, such that satisfying a stronger condition, such that if you're topologically nilpotent, uh, then the, uh, for all you know, gamma in gamma, there exists an n in n, such that the valuation of f to the n uh, is less than gamma. Okay, so there's some subtlety here uh, that uh, the space that Huber localizes over is actually smaller than the space that we localize over. Um, but yeah, so the, the, the distinction only occur occurs for higher rank valuations, but I shouldn't say only because in, in higher dimensions, higher rank valuations are just everywhere. So there's actually a huge difference. Um, but uh, but Huber shows, uh, and and I uh, and I should and I should say that this, um, yeah, so continuing the remark. So this this drr plus does not lie over, uh, but does not live over the subset. Uh, spa r r plus sp of r r plus. In the same, I mean, I, I claimed here that the sheaf here becomes zero when you uh, restrict to the complement of this subset. It's not, that's not what's happening here, but there does exist a map, a retraction. Huh? What's up? Peter? A what? Oh, pff, thank you, thank you. Well, yeah. Does not live over the subset, but. Uh, There is a retraction like this, um, which is actually a quotient. Oh, sorry, R circs, yeah. Which is a realizing. So by definition, it was a subspace, but you can actually realize it as a quotient. And then you do get a sheaf of categories uh, on SPA. And that's the correct way to so to speak, get a, a sheaf of categories on Huber's topological space. And it's the retraction that's kind of the good map in the sense that it, it, this is the quasi-compact map. So um, yeah, we'll probably, so in, in, in general, you get more flexibility for localization using this picture than with Huber's picture. And uh, the kinds of extra things you get are something that we already, for example, the things we already discussed, something like this, so-called functions on the closed unit disk will arise from the structure sheaf in this general setting, but doesn't arise from the structure sheaf in Huber's setting. And um, you, can, uh, you can analyze these things. But I think I've now said enough. Thank you for your attention. So it's fine I remember in this yeah. attraction context. Yeah. So actually, both are spectral spaces, but the inclusion is not spectral. Yeah. In general, the attraction is spectral. Yes, exactly. Moreover, it is such that when you have a sheaf on the bigger thing, then the direct image by the retraction is the same as the restriction to the subspace. For an arbitrary sheaf? No. No. Uh, I, I, as far as I remember, 
the... Ah, yes, yeah, so let me make the... Uh, so so yeah. the, it is a nice uh, situation where, the, in, in particular, the higher direct images for the retraction are zero because of this. Yeah. And uh, now you are dealing with shifts in this infinity set, yeah. so probably the same thing we learned, but uh, not... Yeah, so... Um, yeah, so there's a, a, the basis of rational opens here. You can actually parameterize it by similar data, but with an extra condition that these things generate an open ideal. And then if you pull those rational opens back here, you get exactly the corresponding rational opens as expected. But if you take a general rational open here, not satisfying that condition, and then restrict it, I don't know, if it does satisfy that condition and you restrict it, you get the correct thing. But if it doesn't satisfy that condition and you restrict it, you get something new, which is not necessarily even quasi-compact and not, not a rational open. So you have to, you'd have to write it as a union of rational opens. And this is kind of like, yeah, taking the open unit disk and writing it as a union of closed unit disks is a typical example of that phenomenon. So you... you Yes. So you said something about getting a structural sheaf yes. last time. Yeah. Can you comment on this, or, or will it come later? Uh, yeah, I was, I, was, I was hoping to get to it again today, but I didn't. So it is the, the structure sheaf would just be you take R, which is living globally, and you apply the localization functor to, to get something living in, in here instead. And that's, that's this. Uh, it gives you this object here. And one can analyze it, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And it's also some center of category of some category. Is, is there a way to think of it as a center of a category? Center? I don't know. Yeah. Oh no, but these are symmetric monoidal categories. So it's just it's just the unit. I mean, uh, the unit mm. of the symmetric monoidal derived category of yeah. in this sense. Yeah. Ah, okay. So this. Ah, so you claim that when you take mod R of this, this is actually a, a good thing. With, so it is associated to the, in good cases, it is associated to the over per, associated to the rational domain, yes. except that sometimes you have to you do a derived. Yes. So this is, I mean, this, so this will also correspond to an analytic ring, but. In, a, in the to say in derived sense, so you have to so the notion of analytic ring that we've discussed so far, you had an ordinary condensed ring in a full subcategory. Here you need to not just remember that ordinary derived ring, but you need to remember some derived enhancement of it as well. But then it is enough to just remember the ordinary abelian category of modules over the ordinary thing. Yeah, and and besides the derived stuff, there's also a quasi-separated issue where the value of the structure sheaf might be different for, from Huber's, even if it lives in degree zero, it might, you know, the quotient might not be by a closed ideal, and so it might still differ from Huber's, but again, in practical cases, that doesn't show up. Um, and yeah, even, I guess, even inverting G can introduce non-quasi-separated behavior in general. Yeah, well, I think we'll discuss uh, this in coming lectures, all of these. So, in the, so concerning those two spaces in Huber's yeah. theory, yeah. where you have a retraction, which you, I think he maybe uses slightly different notations, but anyway, it's SPVAI. But, so you have this subspace, living in a slightly bigger thing with a retraction, which is spectral. So you have shifts, you can consider shifts on both things. What I said, I think is correct, that the direct, I, that the restriction to the subspace is like a direct image. Okay. Then, you have a shift, like yeah, in this case, a shift of categories in some higher sense, mm -hmm. on the full thing, and then you take the direct image yes. to the subspace, which yeah. is like restriction in some yeah. hypothesis. Yeah. But the question it can also be asked about, so you have particular shifts on the full thing, which are direct images by the inclusion of shifts on the subspace. So the, the, so the question is like in this context, so you have your, let us say you have a, a rational open in the bigger thing, and you consider its intersection with the smaller size. But you said that you can write it as a union of things. Yes. So you can evaluate your shift by, in this way, by inverse limit of those. Yes. Is it equivalent to the shift, to the value on the original thing in the big, in SPV? So, so not like whether the shift of categories is the direct image of its restriction to the subspace. Which, so, 
Which you, you, you have on SPV R, yes. R plus yeah. R zero zero. Yeah. You have let us say some stock let us yes. say of categories. Yes, yes, yes. You can you can take its direct image to which I think is the same as the restriction to that. Okay. Yes. And then you, it is a canonical adjunction map for to R lower star to the let's say I is the inclusion. It has a canonical oh, adjunction yeah. to I I lower no, star. It's R not, R yeah, it's not the same because for example on global sections you can see something like a. Ah, uh, well, no, it's not the same because um, for the category, you have a, a, a rational subset corresponding to the closed unit disk uh, giving you this. And in this, in the category of modules over this guy, say uh, the unit is compact, but when you when you go through that procedure again. The analytic function is not this thing. The yeah. global analytic function is just certain oh, where you don't invert a fixed power field, just a convergence on each disk. Yes, 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 yes. So you get another ring of function, yes. this is something yes. else. So this is another theory. Yeah. So it is not, so the answer is not. No, there's really more data in the, in the, in the, okay. in the structure sheaf on this guy. And of, of what one can do in usual yes. analysis. Exactly, exactly. Which is, okay. Okay, so uh, yeah, maybe if there are more questions, I can handle them on a personal basis. Let's release the people from the room. Yes.